Hi, my name is Scott Gibson uh, with Beneath the Surface, and I'm here with Lawrence Rolston of Resource Opportunities. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, Scott. Great to be here. Thanks for being with us. I um, wanted to ask you about the cycle, the mining industry cycle that we're in right now. Uh, we're in a bear market, but in a longer-term cyclical bull market. Uh, where do you think we are in that process? We're still very early into this cycle. You know, the developing world is, is just beginning the process of development. You know, China is partway through it. India is just getting started. There's, you know, I Indonesia and all these other places have just begun you know, that, that kind of modernization process that, that we've seen in China. So we've got years and years and years of, of growth in the developing world. And at the same time, on the you know, supply side in the metals, there are very serious constraints. You know, the industry is not expanding production nearly as fast as they need. Uh, th there's a huge challenge in the mining industry just to replace depleted mines and maintain the level of production, let alone keep up with the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people think of this market as cyclical and, you know, in, in decades gone by, there were big increases in production that followed increases in prices and then the prices came crashing back down. But it's a lot harder now to find new deposits and, and especially big high grade deposits. So it's going to take many, many years for the mining industry to develop enough new production, production capacity to come anywhere near catching up to the, uh, the growth in demand. Well, that bodes well for the junior companies, for the explorers. Uh, but right now, it seems like there's so many investors out there thinking or fearing we're near the end of the world or everything's falling apart. What do you have to say to that? Well, if we're looking at metal markets, you know, what's going on in, in Greece and Spain and Portugal is absolutely irrelevant in terms of, of the overall market for metals. You know, China is by far the biggest consumer of metals across the board, pretty much. and. China, you know, they're, they're, people are talking about the slowdown of the Chinese economy. Right, we're going from twelve percent growth to eight percent growth, or just below eight. Well, e exactly, and and they talk about the fears of a hard landing. Let's put this in a perspective. You know, the um, the objective reports talk about the probability of a hard landing in the order of five or ten percent probability, and define a hard landing as growth in the order of five to seven percent. So. You know, if, if we're talking about a five or ten percent probability of slowing down to only five or seven percent growth, um, we're still using an enormous amount of metal, and we're using more metal every year, and and that's the biggest market for metals. So, well, and like you say, it's growth in China on top of previous year's growth. We're talking twelve years of growth for a number of years that slowed down to eight now, but well, it's still that much more. That's right. The increase in the economic activity in China at a slower pace of growth this year is equivalent, in real terms, to the amount of growth in, in China last year, mm -hmm. because it, as you say, it's on it's on a bigger base. And um, you know, India's also headlines talking about India slowing down, slowing down from seven or eight percent growth to five percent growth, still using more metal every year. Mm. And you know, you can look at the copper price, and and it's down from where it was, you know, a year ago, or certainly down from its high. It's at a level where the copper producing companies are still making a lot of money. But most importantly, the mining industry, whether it's copper or or you know any other metal, gold, silver iron, they're going to be developing new mines. And that's really the focus, is the companies that are finding and developing the deposits that will feed into the ongoing growth in, in productive capacity in the mining industry. That's the story. Not, not you know, as so many people do, they get hung up on, on the copper price today versus yesterday versus tomorrow. And, and that's really irrelevant. We're looking at a long-term cycle of mining industry needing to build new mines and those mines coming from the exploration development companies. And where would you think that, or where would you say investors should be looking right now? Here we are in a bear market, things have pulled back. As part, as you're saying, of a longer term bull market, and I agree with that premise, where's the place, where's the opportunity? At this time, the average retail investor is completely out of the market, may not come into the market for a long time. So a lot of the plays that are, are just kind of retail investor oriented plays, you know, the, the uh, closeology plays and area plays and that, that sort of thing. It's going to be a long time before we see growth coming back into that market. Where I'm focusing right now are on 
companies that have metal deposits that are prospects for takeovers by the larger companies. Um, so they, they've got to be large, they've got to be in favorable jurisdictions, and uh, they've got to be far enough along that um, e even if they don't have a feasibility study completed, but at least far enough along that the majors can look at them and recognize whether or not there's any fatal flaws in, uh, in the development process. And is there a particular uh, area or region or metal or, or type that you're looking at right now? Well, from a jurisdiction perspective, y you know, last week, you know, we saw the Bolivian president announced they were taking over South American silver. Certainly the, you know, the whole Latin American uh, political situation is, is seen by investors, you know, they're, they're becoming more and more wary about, about the whole uh, <clears throat> of Latin America. Other parts of the world, you know, great parts of Africa are such that the major mining companies are going to be reluctant to want to invest serious amounts of money in many countries. So safe jurisdictions are more and more important. Close to home, you know, Canada, the United States, certainly, you know, particular states within the United States, most of Canada, very, very attractive right now. And, um, and, and we're seeing that in, in the mining industry. You know, British Columbia for years was really out of favor for investors. Mm -hmm. And now most of the major mining companies have reestablished exploration programs in British Columbia. I think that's very significant. Uh, you know, we still have questions about the political situation here, but relative to what's happening in so many other parts of the world, British Columbia is looking more and more attractive. It is, but I should ask that question in terms of uh, the recent polls in BC showing that NDP is leading and if the election were to happen now would win the election and potentially cause problems for the mining industry. Well, certainly the fear of an NDP election in British Columbia has created a lot of concern among a lot of investors. The activity of the mining industry, the majors that are, are spending serious amounts of money exploring in the province, suggests that maybe a, the reality is, is not as great as, as that perception. I, I would have to say that, that the NDP more likely will take a practical view and recognize the job creation potential of the mining industry. Y you know, the concern in British Columbia is that the NDP is seen as more environmentally aware and therefore would oppose mining. But you've got to remember that there's a big component of the NDP that are the blue collar workers outside of you know the Vancouver urban area. And for them, the most important thing in life is is a is a steady job. And and I think that side of the NDP is going to have more of an influence and I, I think they're going to take a practical view and and recognize the importance of mining to their British Columbia economy. Mm -hmm. And what about particular metals? Are you in copper, gold, silver? Well, clearly gold and silver are at the top of the list right now because that's where investors, you know, to the extent that they're looking at the mining industry, are more likely to focus. Um, so most of what I'm doing is, is focused on companies that are looking at, you know, gold and silver projects. However, all of the other metals, the, the fundamental story is very strong. And whereas gold and silver companies have been badly beaten up in this market, the base metal companies have been completely destroyed in value to the point where you can get companies with good assets almost for nothing. And, and so the, the value premise in, on the base metal side is, is even better than it is on the gold and silver side. So I'm, I'm looking very seriously. Copper, of course, is, is the most popular. Mm -hmm. um, zinc, in a couple of years, I think we're, we're going to look back and, and wish that we'd paid more attention to, to zinc because the fundamentals for, for zinc are, are very compelling at this time. But you've mentioned to me in the past there's a way to play zinc where you still get the exposure to the precious metals. Well, yes, and, and that is um, most silver deposits contain a very, fairly significant credit of, of, of zinc and lead. And one of my favorite plays right now are, um, are silver plays that stand on their own as a silver play, but have a significant zinc and lead uh, credit. And so you're, you're getting the near-term value premise on the silver, but longer term, if, if zinc does as, as we expect it will, then you're gonna, there, there's going to be a second 
bonus there. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that. The other thing you've talked about is how important, and you always hammer on how important management is, but also in these kind of markets, how important cash is. And what are you seeing out there? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I'm sure everybody that, that talks about the mining industry talks about the importance of management. And um, I, I would just add to that that uh, one of my greatest thrills in life is is finding the the management team that is going to be seen a year from now as as the as the superstar team, and in other words, the undiscovered young guys that are, are coming up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had a few you know great successes on on being early to identify uh, rising talent. So I'm I'm still very much focused on that, and and there's some people out there that are are very interesting that I'm I'm keeping an eye on right now. Uh, money, uh, you know. In this market at this time is is critical. Cash is king. Cash is king, absolutely. At, at the best of times, and, and right now is, is essential. Now, that's not to say that companies that don't have money won't be able to raise it. They th there's going to be all kinds of deals out there raising money. Mm -hmm. But when you see a company struggling to get their share price up to a nickel, so they can do a nickel financing, and and you know diluting 100% of, of the outst uh, current outstanding shares mm -hmm. to drill a few holes in the ground. The prospect for making money on those kind of deals is, is getting more and more remote. Mm -hmm. So companies that have cash and don't need to go to the market at this time are in a much stronger position. And not just being able to fund their program without having to raise money, but companies that have cash and, and I'm, I'm seeing this in a number of cases where they're becoming like vultures and, and they're, they're, they're circling around looking for wounded prey. <laughs> and, and there's going to be some of these companies with cash are going to have even more good assets a year from now than, than they have at, at this time. Mm -hmm. Well, and you combine, especially in this market, good quality management with cash, that's what we're going to do. They may have a resource or an asset already, but if they can acquire a few more, and build up the treasure chest before the gold price starts to move, before the market starts to pick up. It's a great place to be. A absolutely. And you've mentioned some where they're trading at or near cash value, where they're in that kind of a situation. I, I'm looking at a bunch of companies right now with good assets that are trading just over cash value. And perhaps the most extreme example of that is uh, is Keegan. You know, Keegan has over $200 million of cash, and its market value is, is not much ahead of its cash in the bank. It has a 5 million ounce gold deposit in, in Ghana, and, and it's, it's a pretty good deposit. You know, investors were disappointed when they uh, published the, uh, the study on, on that deposit. But that's not to say it's not a good deposit. In, in fact, you know, they, they raised the money in anticipation that they would see it developed. And then the capital cost came in well ahead of the initial estimates. And um, a, a lot of investors realized that the cash they had was not going to be enough to take it to production mm -hmm. and change the valuation picture. So I think there's you know strong institutional selling pressure on that stock that's pushed it down to cash value. So there's just one example of, of a company where you, you can buy it for effectively cash value and, and get a good gold deposit mm -hmm. almost for nothing. And full, the full disclosure, that's exactly what I did. I own it. How about yourself? Well, I, I own it as well, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Lawrence, for being with us and giving us sort of a broader perspective of where we are in this cycle, what's happening right now, what to be looking at, and a particular company to, to check out. Again, that's Lawrence Rolston, Resource Opportunities. My name is Scott Gibson with Beneath the Surface. Thanks for being with us.